you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 8. I want to read a quick verse that's really the anchor for this entire series. And then I want to spend the majority of our time in 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to teach out of 1 Kings 19. If you were here last Sunday, you know we kicked off a series called Soul Care. Somebody say Soul Care. Uh, Jesus said these words in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, and what do you benefit? What good is it if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? He's talking about gaining and losing in a culture that says acquire, acquire, get more, increase. Jesus challenges us. What does it profit us if we gain the whole world, but we lose our own soul? And then he asks this question, is anything worth more than your soul? Uh, This whole series, I think, perhaps could be the most important series we talk about all year long, placing value where it matters most. Last week, we said our soul is eternal. A lot of the things that we chase and pursue that we think will make us happy, it's temporary. Wouldn't you hate to put so much priority on something that's temporary and yet neglect what's going to live and last forever? Uh, That's why we're going to take a deep dive over the next several weeks to unpack what does it mean to care for your soul? If our souls are so important then what do we do to take care of them? Uh, Last week, I gave you this picture, uh, and we'll put it up on the screen again. We said that God is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three expressions, one God. We see that clearly throughout Scripture. The Bible tells us that we were made in his likeness and in his image. So we are trinity as well. We are body, physical bodies. We are soul and we are spirit, made in his life. It just makes sense. How many know that God does all things well? And we're learning and discovering, and maybe it takes our our whole lives to reach a certain understanding, but God did this thing in perfection, and he wants us to take care of ourselves completely, body, soul, and spirit. Last week, and I was so excited when they told us this, we offered this book to you, Soul Keeping, Soul Keeping. It's in the, uh, the cafe at all of our campuses. Last week, we completely sold out. I mean, you cleaned the shelves. Um, we have limited supply left, but if you're interested in doing some study on your own, this is a great resource, soul keeping. Uh, The author is John Ortberg. He's one of my favorite authors. He's super, super smart, but man, breaks it down in a practical and tangible way. I think this is a great companion study to the scriptures because God's word has a lot to say about taking care of your soul. Uh, Last week, if you were here, we gave you a general overview about what a healthy soul looks like. Uh, Next week, I'm going to talk to you about depression. Okay, Uh, we're going to do a deep dive into the darkness of depression. And I know that we come to church to be happy, but how many of you know sometimes you got to lean into people's pain? I mean, we're not here just faking it, acting like we have it all together. We're going to remove the stigma that sometimes is associated with mental health and depression. The Bible talks about it. We're going to unpack some things. Uh, In this series, we're going to talk about fear and anxiety. Uh, I don't want you to miss a single Sunday over the next four weeks. But the topic I want to talk to you about today is simply this, stress and burnout. Stress and burnout. Some of you are like, okay, pastor. How many of you, are, you, you, you need this one today? Anybody, am I talking to anybody? Hum at me today? Mm-hmm. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it to church today. Tell them, because you're stressing me out. (laughs) Oh, man. What is stress? Clinical definition of stress. Any type of change. Watch this. The clinical definition of stress. Any type of change that causes physical, emotional, or psychological strain. When there's a change in your life, that creates a strain, either physically, emotionally, psychologically. That's called stress. Where does stress come from? 
You know, what, what happens in our lives when we feel this strain? Maybe it's a job interview. How many of you know there's a little stress when you go on a job interview? Or maybe you're giving a big presentation. Have you ever had to give one at work? And man, you didn't sleep well the night before, standing in front of a group of people, talking to thousands. <laughs> it's a lonely place. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's going to a new school. We just started a school year. I know that sometimes there's some anxiety, not just in students, but also in teachers. I mean, when you're, when you're in school, you're taking tests. Has anybody ever stressed over a test? Oh, yeah, some of you, you got through your entire academic career, one stressful subject after another, and graduated. Some of you graduated summa cum laude. Some of you graduated magna cum laude. Some of you graduated just, thank you, dear Lottie. <laughs> I didn't even plan on saying that. That was kind of cool, huh? You like that, babe? That wasn't even written in my notes. All different kinds of things stress us out. Can you remember when you went on your first date? How many need to go on a date? <laughs> that could be stressful. You know, I thought about the babies that we dedicated. Parents having a newborn Oh, sweet Jesus, I hope you were praying over these moms and dads. You know, sometimes we, we lose a, a friend, a, a family member. Sometimes we have to bury a loved one. Anytime there's a change in our life that creates pressure or strain mentally, physically, or emotionally. Now, here's some interesting stress facts. I got to hurry because I want to get to 1 Kings 19. Did you know that Americans are one of the most stressed out people in the world? Isn't that crazy to be first world and so blessed? We generate more stress in America. It's 20% higher than the global average. Okay, think about that. 94% of workers report feeling chronic stress at work. Do you know that the least, according to this study, now I don't know the metrics, but according to this study that I read, do you know the least stressed state in America? Anybody want to take a guess? What state of the 50 is considered the least stressful? Some of you said Hawaii. Oh, man, they're, they're under a lot of stress right now. No, it's not Hawaii. It's Montana. How many of you feel like, oh, Healing Place needs a campus in Montana? Big sky in Jesus' name. Montana was the least stressed. Do you know what the most stressed state in America was? Louisiana. <laughs> Can you believe that? They said that Louisiana, now I don't know the study and I don't know the questions. Maybe they looked at our traffic. How many have ever been stressed in traffic? Maybe they considered the, the storms, the natural disasters. Come on. Maybe it's the heat. Anybody watch an LSU football game and just stress to the max? Maybe that's why the food in Louisiana is better than anywhere in the world. Because we stress eat. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. The most common sources of stress, work. How many of you are stressed at work? How many of you, your boss stresses you out? I just saw three of my staff raise their hand. <laughs> Work can be stressful. People stress over finances. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I didn't see that. Uh, finances are a big stressor. Family drama. Mm. Somebody say, save the drama for your mama. Physical health can be a stressor. Relationships can be a stressor. Stress is everywhere. You know the irony why do we take vacations to get away from stress? Have you ever taken a vacation to get away from stress, only to come home more stressed out than when you left? Oh, yeah, the last few days before you get out of town, you're getting everything done, and then you're trying to pack the clothes, and then you got to get the kids ready, and then you pile them up. And if you're driving in a car, it's like, when are we going to get there? When Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And they're fighting in the back seat. Or if you're driving a plane, oh, or, you don't drive a plane. If you're flying, yeah, I'm so stressed right now. I can't think. 
If you're flying with small children, getting through TSA and man, making sure everybody, you know, when you get there and you know what you paid for the vacation, you want your kids to have a good time. Bless God, I'm paying $35 for that Coke. You will enjoy it and you will not complain in Jesus' name. <laughs> Are we having fun yet? <laughs> And we stand in long lines and we melt in the hot sun and we try to ride rides because we want to escape stress. And then we get home and we go to work the next day and they say, how was your vacation? You're like, I need another one. <laughs> stress is everywhere. Listen, you may not be able to avoid stress, but there's a biblical way to manage it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, let me give you some context. We're going to read about a man named Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. Elijah, God used him to do exploits throughout the nation of Israel. In fact, the Bible refers to Elijah as the man of God. <laughs> How would you like that, that to be your nickname? The man of God. I try to get my wife to refer to me. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I don't. She won't. <laughs> but but in, in chapter 18, before we read chapter 19, I want, to, I want to explain to you what's happened. Elijah calls the, the king of Israel and all the leaders of the nation together, and he challenges them because they've been worshiping the gods of Baal. There's a bunch of false prophets. People have forsaken the one true living God, and they're, they're going down this pagan path of self-destruction. How many of you know when you eliminate God from your life, you invite chaos and craziness in? When you kick God out, you open the door to all kinds of craziness. You can see it happening in America today. Elijah steps up and challenges them to a contest on the top of Mount Carmel. And I've stood on the top of that mountain back in 2017, that place where this showdown happened. And he says, listen, you're serving Baal? Okay, then, then you prepare whatever sacrifice that Baal requires, and I'm going to pray, prepare the sacrifice that God requires. You pray to your God, and I'm going to pray to my God. And the God who answers by fire is the one true living God. And you know the story. The false prophets, they, for hours, they prayed, they yelled, they screamed, they even cut themselves, trying to get their God to answer, and nothing happened. And Elijah just takes one moment. He says one prayer. And boom, he calls down fire. Whew, that sacrifice was consumed. There's a reason why he was the man of God, because he could call down fire. Now, you would think at that moment, the king and all the people would say, Elijah, you're right. We will worship God. You would think that that would be the turning point for revival. Instead, here's what happens. King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, was so upset that all of her prophets had been defeated, she made a death threat on Elijah and says, I'm going to kill you before this day's over. Now, 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 now watch what happens here, because sometimes we say, well, if, if, if I just had enough faith, I wouldn't be stressed out. Or if I just prayed more, or if I was just stronger, if I could just be a better Christian, I wouldn't be stressed. Can I tell you this? I know this is a church full of dynamic and powerful people, but I don't think any of us can call down fire like the prophet Elijah did. And yet we're going to see a man of God who was under stress. He was so distressed. Look at what it says in 1 Kings 19 verse 3. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. So he went to Beersheba. That's important. We'll talk about that in just a moment. After this incredible victory on the mountaintop, he flees to Beersheba, a town in southern Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree. Some translations say a juniper tree. And he prayed that he might die. I'm telling you, stress can be suffocating. He says, Lord, I've had enough. Just take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died before me. Then he lay down and he slept 
under that broom tree. Now, in this little passage here, I want to quickly give you three things. Here are three signs of stress-related burnout. And, and there's a reason why I'm connecting th- these challenges to this great, I mean, uh, Elijah was the, the man of God, the man of the hour, the tower of power, too sweet to be sour. But he was just as human as you and me. So you, you, you hear the desperate plea of this prophet of the Lord. You see what's happening here. There are three signs of stress-related burnout. Number one, exhaustion. He was totally exhausted. The Bible says he went from Mount Carmel down to Beersheba. You know what that distance was? A hundred miles. That's like running an ultra marathon. Uh, how many of you, you, how many's ever run a marathon? Any marathoners do we have? Okay. Some of us, Jeff, I didn't know you were a marathon. You ran 26.2 miles. Wow. Four hours and 45 minutes, 26 point. How many of you have a hard time running point two? My brother ran 26.2. Elijah ran 100 miles to Beersheba. He was exhausted. You know, when we go too hard, too long, we will eventually run ourselves into the ground. You know, your body produces a certain hormone when it's under stress. I know you know this. You know, there's certain adrenals. There's a cortisol level. When you're under stress, your cortisol levels climb. Have you heard of the, 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 the phrase fight or flight? Yeah, your body goes into fight or flight mode. Notice this. Elijah was both. He fought against the prophets of Baal, and now he's fleeing from Jezebel. This guy was totally exhausted. You know, you think about what your body does physically when you're under stress. And, and stress can be emotional. It can be spiritual. It can be psychological. But you feel it in your bodies. And, and you know, as your body, if you produce this, this hormone for extended amounts of time, the body eventually shuts down and says, I can't produce it anymore. It's kind of like if you put your AC unit, if you set your thermostat to 66 and it's 105 degrees, you know, for the last 30 days, how many of you know your your unit is going to break down? And some of you, you feel the pains of stress in your physical body. Elijah was just totally exhausted. The second thing, not only is it about exhaustion, but stress can produce isolation. Notice what the scripture says. He gets to Beersheba, and he left his servant there. He went alone into the wilderness. It's amazing how stress can drive you. It can deplete you physically, but it can drive you into isolation. And I want to, uh, we'll talk more about this in just a moment, but there's a danger when you're isolated. When you're, when you're exhausted, and you separate yourselves from others, then you are vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. He can create a narrative in your mind. You can get cynical. You can get suspicious of other people. You can become bitter. I mean, you can detect some of this in in what Elijah was saying. He was saying, Lord, I'm here by myself. I got nobody. I'm done. Notice exhaustion led to isolation, and then eventually the third thing was escape. Escape. Notice what it says here. He sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. He said, Lord, I've had enough. Have you ever had stress on you so intense that it made you want to quit everything? Anybody know what I'm talking about today? Is it okay to be honest and vulnerable in church? Man, we're talking about where we live. Sometimes even the most simplest of tasks, you just feel paralyzed, immobilized. You want to check out. Stress can be so overwhelming. You know something I've learned about myself? I've learned that because I'm a people pleaser by nature. Do we have any people pleasers in the house? Yeah, I just I want people to be happy. I, I do. I want them to be happy with me. And I've learned... It's impossible. 
<laughs> you know, when I was a youth pastor, oh, man, everybody loved me. Everybody loved the youth pastor. Man, oh, Mike, he's so fun. He's so crazy. Man, he's just with our kids. Man, bring your kids to the youth group, man. They got a great youth pastor. They love Pastor Mike. Everybody, oh, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. <laughs> and then when I became the senior pastor, oh, dear God. <laughs> everybody who's upset at the church is mad at me. Can't do anything right. Man, making a decision, and man, you're going to make somebody upset. And You know, how many of you know that if you want to make everybody happy, you might as well go sell ice cream? <laughs> but if you're going to lead something, how many know that you're going to upset some people sometimes? And I've realized, that and I'm growing through this, but I realize sometimes when, when, when somebody's displeased with me, I feel the stress levels in my body. Some days I'm like, Lord, can I just be a youth pastor again? I just want to get out of here. just want to escape. So he runs to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai. Now notice who was famous at Mount Sinai. Moses. Isn't that where Moses got the Ten Commandments? Don't you think Elijah was comparing himself to Moses, seeing that where Moses succeeded, that he had failed? Come on, stress will lie to you. Come on, somebody. Now, now let me hustle through this. God doesn't leave Elijah in this state of burnout. But he meets Elijah right where he is. And I want you to know, God will meet you right in the middle of your stress. Here are three things that God did for Elijah in his lowest moments. Now, I, I, wanna he, I want you to hear me say this. Because people will never forget how you treat them in their lowest moments. And we serve a God who cares for us even in our worst Oh, can somebody say amen? If you find yourself exhausted, isolated, and with a desire to just check out, let me tell you what God did for Elijah, he wants to do for you. Watch this. If you're taking notes, write down this word connection. Here's three needs that we have when we're stressed. We have a need for connection. 1 Kings 19 verse 5, the Bible says this, but as Elijah was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. You see, this scripture reminds me of our need for connection. You and I were not built to do life alone. Your spirit needs to be connected to God and to others. Can I have a good amen? He was literally touched by an angel. The angel of the Lord touched him. You know, sometimes when you're stressed, Community is what you want the least, but what you need the most. Come on, am I talking to anybody? Being connected to God and to others. In fact, I want you to do this. I want you to put your hand out in front of you just for a second. Quit taking notes, and I want you to just, there's a little illustration I want to give you. Did you know that in your hand, there are 17,000 touch receptors 17,000 in that hand of yours. And those fingertips in that palm, you have 17,000 touch receptors. I'll never forget the first time I held Rachel's hand. And it was in church, too. The pastor said, reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. I was like, yes, Lord. And I reached down because the pastor said it, right? The pastor said, I'm just obeying the Lord. Reached down and took her by the hand. And we didn't just hold hands like this. We did like this. Hi. <laughs> and I heard the heavenly choir begin to sing. The hallelujah chorus was happening right there in my seat. Man, it was fire. It was electricity touch receptors. You know, God wants you to know that there are helping hands all around you. In fact, won't you do this? Won't you give that person next to you a high five? Pop. Hey, what are you telling them? You just got 17,000 reasons to believe that I'm with you and that I'm for you. Can I have a good amen? That's why we hug. That's why we shake hands. That's why we give high fives. You know why? Because we need connection. Man, we need each other. That's why we give Pentecostal handshakes. Come on, somebody. You know what a Pentecostal handshake is? 
How many of you do not know what I'm talking about when I say Pentecostal handshake? Okay, when somebody shakes your hand and they put money in that hand. Oh, glory. You're like, well, why, why, Pastor, do we call it a Pentecostal handshake? Because Pentecostals love to shout. And when they put money in your hand like that, you be shouting in Jesus' name. Listen, Friday morning, we had a, a prayer meeting with some of the business guys right here. Man, I, I, I was at a place in my own physical and emotional being where I was deplete. And you know what these men did? They laid hands on me. They gathered around me and they prayed over me. And you know what? In that moment, there was a divine connection that I needed, not just in my body, but in my soul. Can I have a good amen? And then somebody shook my hand and gave me a Pentecostal handshake. And I walked out of this church with revival in my heart. A little money in my pocket in Jesus' name. Connection is huge. Look at this. The second thing, restoration. Uh, the Bible says Elijah looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. What? Elijah had just taken a nap. He woke up from a nap to this. So he ate and drank and he laid back down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. Check this out. Elijah takes two naps and he eats two snacks. Come on, can you say double blessed? You miss the days of kindergarten. Remember when you would bring your mat to school because there was nap time? How many of you wish you could go back to those days? Oh, man, and then you, your mama packed you with a little something extra because there would be some snack opportunities. Man, naps and snacks, you're like, Mike, how, that's so carnal. Can you be spiritual? Listen, for some of you, the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's good for your body, not just good for your so, Charles Spurgeon said this, the spirit needs to be fed and the body needs feeding as well. Do not forget these matters. It may seem to some people that I ought not to mention such small things as food and rest, but these may be the very first elements in really helping a poor, depressed servant of God. That's a big deal. Some of you this afternoon, you need to lay down and just take a nap. Wake up and eat your little snack and then lay back down again. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 23? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Oh, come on, somebody say soul care. Take care of your bodies. Listen to what your body is telling you. If you see a check engine light on the dashboard of your car and you ignore it, you will regret it. Somebody say connection. Say restoration. Say hope. Come on, I ask the team to come up and I want to finish right here. Then he came to a cave where he spent the night and the Lord said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Can I tell you this? When God asks you a question, it's not because he lacks information. It's almost like what God said to Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you? God wasn't confused. He wanted Adam to locate himself. Some of you, this message is locating you. God wants you to be self-aware. Where are you? What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've, I've zealously served the Lord, God Almighty. But the people of Israel, they've broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. I'm glad that the Bible puts this verse in this narrative because even the prophet needed a place to vent. He needed a safe space to unpack all of the hurt, all of the pressure, all of the fear. Notice he thought he was the only one. When you isolate yourself, it's easy to think, I'm the only one. God, later on in this chapter, tells him, no, you're not, Elijah. I got 7,000 others that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Can I tell you this? You're not alone. God wants you to know you are not alone. When Elijah heard the voice of God, perspectives changed.
changed. His perspective was transformed. Some of you here today, you need hope. You need to know that you're not alone. You need to know that God sees you. And you need to know that he is addressing every area of your life that's concerning to you. One word from God changes everything. And my prayer for you is that you would quiet the noise around you so you could hear the whisper of God inside of you. See, the Bible says that, that there was a, an earthquake, there was a windstorm, and there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in any of those things. The Lord spoke to Elijah in a whisper, a still, small voice. Do you hear the voice of God today? In the midst of your strain and stress and pressure and all that's happening in your world, God's wanting to whisper 